everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Philips. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Please join us after the webinar for a guided meditation session with Casey Lane. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from the American Hospital Association, Priya Bathija. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this Health Go Live event, Breaking the Mold in Healthcare. I'm Priya Bathija, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at the American Hospital Association, and I will be your moderator for today's conversation. Today, I'm excited to have a dialogue about digital transformation and a new frontier that includes virtual care, AI, advanced telemetry, biosensors, 5G-enabled cameras, cloud technologies, and more. Over the next hour, I will be talking with leaders from Philips, Westchester Medical, oh, sorry, Philips, um, Intercept Telemed, and Blue Shield of California who will share how digital transformation can improve patient care through more efficient care delivery and operating models. We have a lot to learn from our speakers, so let's get started. To kick, th to kick things off, I would like to introduce our speakers. Today, I'm joined by Yarun Toss, Chief Innovation and Strategy Officer at Philips, Dr. Diego C. Reno, Founder and CEO of Intercept Telemed, Lisa Davis, SVP and CIO of Blue Shield of California, Welcome, Yarun, Diego, and Lisa. I'd like to get started by setting the stage for the future. So as we think about digital transformation and this new frontier of technology, can you briefly share your vision for the future of the healthcare ecosystem? Um, Yarun, we can start with you and then turn to Lisa and Diego. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the future is getting clearer by the day uh, because we're just uh, coming out of the pandemic and I think we all experience what it is to do things from home and to interact with your caregivers from home. And I think going forward, it will be on the terms of the consumer, the health consumer, and uh, technology will guide them through the healthcare system, which can be complex, which can be, you know, a complex treatment like cancer, uh, where you have to go through chemo and go back home and be guided and supported. It can be, you know, like my daughter who's type one diabetic, but who has to problems with her kidneys, with her mental health. It can be like myself, I have kidney problems. Um, but all of us, we experience these disjointed, um, you know, episodes that need to be stringed together um, where data follows you and where care will be coordinated on your behalf. And yeah, you talked about wearables. I have actually two of them here. One is a 5G wearable. It's quite new. It's directly connected, provisioned. And this is a small wearable that you stick up and connect to your phone. And this is not just a monitor, it can monitor you, you know, when your cardiologist, for instance, want to keep, keep tabs on you and see if there's stabilization or deterioration. Actually, we um, are in the process of doing clinical trials on a COVID detection algorithm. So this can be used also to diagnose disease and um, having that connected into a longitudinal view of your own health, which will then trigger the right caregivers to participate, which may not necessarily be clinical expert in oncologist or cardiologist or an internist. It may actually be your family. So um, we're looking to a model where members of the family can also become part of the care team for an elder parent that, that lives at home. So it will be on terms of the consumer, it will be orchestrated for you and data will stream in and um, the intelligence will trigger the right events that for you to connect you to your caregiver. And a lot of that will be virtually, but still you have to go to a hospital, maybe for a procedure or for an ultrasound or an MRI. Um, but these will be the exceptions. The, the, the rule will be, it will be there for you all day long. Wonderful. Um, Lisa, how, how are you looking at the future? Yeah, well, I was excited listening to Arun talk about his vision. Our vision is, is very similar, which is very exciting. I want to start by 
first thanking everyone for inviting me to participate in the panel. Um, we also believe at Blue Shield of California that the pandemic has really brought to the forefront the urgent need to create a digital health ecosystem in the US. And we need to work together to unleash what I like to call a technical revolution in healthcare. Now is the time. And, and payers in large part are driving the need for changes in that end user consumer experience that my colleague was just referring to. We wanna help our patients focus on holistic health wellness, preventive care, and condition reversal programs. And to create this digital health ecosystem, it has to start with data interoperability and data sharing. And we need to involve our infrastructure to be cloud ready and data ready uh, to provide this data and analytics to ultimately help drive better health outcomes and to better inform and ultimately drive our strategies. At, at Blue Shield of California, we, we believe this vision, we call it Health Reimagined. And Health Reimagined is our innovative plan to transform the healthcare system with really a three-pronged approach. And these, uh, this approach focuses on the following three priorities. One, holistic health, addressing key drivers of our health, social, environmental, clinical, genetic, and behavioral factors and then connecting members to essential community services. It needs to be personalized. Our care model should be data-driven, it should be evidence-based, but most importantly, patient-centered. Uh, designed to enable and reward our physicians and hospitals for better outcomes, value-based care, and to create that retail-like experience that frankly our members are craving for, digital, retail-like, consumer-like services they receive from other sectors that they do business with. And last but not least, certainly, it has to be high tech and high touch. So we're deploying technology to support care that is safe and effective and removing those inefficiencies to ultimately reduce the cost of healthcare to make it sustainably mm -hmm. affordable for our family and friends. Thanks, Lisa. I love that concept of high tech and high touch. Um, Diego, um, I'll turn to you. Um, thoughts on the future of healthcare? Great, thanks. And first, uh, I, um, I'd like to second everyone's, um, you know, sort of comments. And I thank you for for having us here and 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 to join this excellent panel of, of folks who are really are, are the leaders in um, in healthcare as as it as we're moving into the next digital age and. Um, I would have to I would have to echo those sentiments. I mean, I think uh, at, at Intercept Telemed, what what we're looking to strive for is to really take the original Institute of Medicine uh, report uh, that was back in I think 2005, which is which said that to air is human, and I think that uh, much of what we have taken from that initial concept is to see how can we figure out ways to take the technology that is before us and to be able to, to analyze the data, to be able to uh, take clinical data that is actionable in real time, as opposed to four, six hours after the fact. And how can we take that information and make it so um, that it translates into real patient outcomes where patients are doing better, um, patients are leaving the hospital faster, there's less complications. And, um, and ultimately, we know that um, better care is also cheaper care. And so what we're seeing now is, is that through the coupling of both technology as well as, um, uh, as really uh, expert uh, clinical care, both from physicians and nurses, what our patients, um, who, who are obviously our primary customers, uh, what their, their expectation is, is that they should be doing better. And, and I fully anticipate that given the, the last year, um, uh, what we're in, in, in surviving this pandemic and what um, is in store for the future, I believe that healthcare is primed for, uh, for the acceptance of, of using telemedicine and using wearable devices and using big data to be able to help forge ahead what the, the future of medicine will be. And, and the expectation is, is that we will uh, be able to use that data to bring better outcomes. Uh, the days of, of we think that this is a good idea are, are behind us. Um, and, and now both payers, patients, hospitals, all the, you know, our consumers, as well as our clinicians 
are really expecting that that we deliver a higher quality level of care. And, and um, I think the, the market is primed for us moving forward. Thank you, Diego. And I, I agree that the market is primed and COVID has taken us over that hump that we needed to get through um, on a lot of these digital solutions. But you know, while this is all exciting and where we are today is a really great inflection point to the future, there are some areas that we still need to sort of do the work on and move to move forward. Um, so let's start talking about some of those and first focused on digital transformation itself. Um, how do we use digital technologies to meet our patients where they are and to enable new models of care delivery? Um, Diego, maybe I can start with you for this question. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's several options available to us. Um, you know, uh, where, where we work specifically um, uh, at Intercept in, in our relationship with Philips, um, what we're where we're trying to do is utilize uh, specifically in the ICU as well as another. Um, healthcare arenas is, is how do we use audiovisual technology and predictive analytics in order to better support care in the ICU. And so uh, we utilize eCare Manager as, as, as the, the main platform for us to be able to deliver that care. And really um, what that really does is, is provide a, a patient in a rural setting, for instance, in America, where there perhaps may not be an intensivist available to be able to deliver high quality ICU care. Um, and so what, what, what bring coupling technology with professional services does is that it increases immediately. What it does is it increases access. And so um, to someone perhaps in, in an ICU setting somewhere who, who, who would not have had um, access to that level of expertise. So I think that's just one example of how we're meeting the patient where they are. And then beyond that, as, as uh, um, Arun was mentioning at, at the beginning of the discussion is, is how do we now take what we've been doing now for roughly about 15 years and, and, and uh, really mastering over the last uh, uh, decade how do we take that and expand it into uh, wearable devices where now patients, uh, the environment is changing, not just from the ICU, but for instance, you have a patient who, who was in the hospital, let's say with COVID. If you can envision a scenario where you have a patient in a rural hospital in uh, the center part of America who was hospitalized with COVID, was cared for through the utilization of an EICU program with a remotely located intensivist, who is delivering care for that patient. And then that patient ultimately makes his or her way through the hospital and eventually is discharged home. And now we're using uh, wearable devices to monitor that patient remotely, um, you know, through an O2 sat monitor or a variety of other wearable devices where that patient is really followed throughout their convalescent um, period and ensuring that that patient doesn't bounce back into the hospital or has a subsequent complication that perhaps we can identify earlier than we would have if the patient now shows up to the ER really an extremis. So this is where both technology as well as a watchful eye from a distance can come together to meet the patient at home as well as in the hospital. That's great. And Yarun, I saw you nodding your head um, yeah, yeah, I would love to um, Diego's up. comment. So I'll turn it to you. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the use case because it's highly relevant. So as we speak, I'm in Amsterdam and again, the ICUs are overflowing because of the third wave. So um, I've been in touch with uh, the CEO of our uh, uh, local hospital here in Amsterdam. And we started looking at, you know, of all these patients in the ICU, 25% are stabilizing. So if we can give them the, the wearable, if we can give them an SpO2 meter and we can do home ventilation, we can just free up 20%. But then um, I said, well, I, I gave Diego's uh, setup as an example. What if all these ICUs were in a network and you know, if the different intensivists can support each other because they're you know, high capacity demands uh, hotspots and what about if we share the data among the 80 hospitals so that we can share protocols and patient data and we bring pharma into it because we can link it back to the vaccination. So, you know, uh, so basically it becomes a data game where you share data and obviously with consent anonymized all the good stuff. 
but secondly, you share the capacity and you make sure that these people have don't access, now suddenly have access to Diego's knowledge. But we, we also can extend it to other you know, areas. So for instance, we're talking ICU, but I, I, I mentioned cancer care and, and really cancer treatment is going really very fast and it's getting very, very sophisticated, but so does the diagnosis. So we can already combine what we see and quantify on images with the pathology, with the liquid biopsy and, and genomics. So we find biomarkers in the genomics, then we can link that back to, you know, is surgery with chemo or should we do imm immuno, immuno with radiation? You know, it, it's getting really complex. So, so we sat down with MD Anderson and we said, well, what if we can use your pathways that, you know, guide the oncologist in the local hospital through this? And if you supply your clinical services to that hospital, then the same hospital that Diego is serving with an intensivist, we now can support with the right onco pathways and they get direction. Okay, now take this image, you take this blood test. Um, here's the therapy that we prescribe. We can help you with that therapy. And suddenly you can see that that rural hospital suddenly has world-class ICU support, but also has world-class onco support. And if we can then link that back to the tools that we give the patients to kind of keep control of their own situation where we keep a watchful eye on, you know, is this the right time? Because we can, this is the right time to come and do your white blood cell count. And this is the right time to do the right dose of chemo because we track all of this. We track your stress levels, et cetera. Um, it will dramatically improve the care, but also like Diego said, if we can pull that up earlier and, uh, and see, because we now glean the data, we, we, we kind of guide that patient where we say, hey, maybe this is now the right time to do that test or that, that image, because we see something that might indicate a deeper dive here. And all of that is not happening because it's happening when it's too late. You, you go and get your image because you really have pain. You really have really chest pain or you know something in your intestines doesn't feel well and if you find out you have you know uh, colon cancer so how can we bring that up how can we link that back and lisa mentioned genomics you know i have a genetic disease myself you know my two brothers have it now it's manageable but if everybody knew this i would have probably had a different way of managing my health and I had to go back and figure it out with my brothers, etc. And this stuff should just be there, you know. It's uh, just like with my daughter, you know. She she told me that I'm the data aggregator and I am the care coordinator. Every time I need to make an appointment, I have to explain my situation again and again. There's no such thing as as proactive care in my case. And then she tells me, Dad, do you know? how many young women like me have anxiety around food and insulin? Because the more insulin you take, you know, the mo more weight you gain. So we always are at the low end of what we do, which again, create, and it's, it's like a, a circle that you cannot, uh, unless you create a virtual care team that says, okay, we have a psychologist that knows how to deal with young women with anxiety around eating and, and insulin. We have a good nurse that helps with the dose. You know, we can read out her continuous glucose meter, but what's equally important is sleep and stress, which we can just glean from the Fitbit. It's neatly presented in a dashboard so that the virtual care team can guide her. That would be ideal. And I, I see, you know, the first signs of people getting their, their arms around these kind of models. So it means access, it means personal, it means holistic. And I think it's all possible now. It wasn't possible two or three years ago. And we can build on the experience that Diego has built on with the hardest use case, because he's supporting the hardest use case, the sickest patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that all makes sense of how it can all come together for that holistic care. Um, Lisa, I wanna touch on this from a payer perspective as well. 
Um, how are you using digital technologies to positively impact um, your members and the providers um, that are working with your organization? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Arun and, and Diego gave such great examples. And as I was listening uh, to them speak, it just reminded me of how siloed we act in healthcare. Um, everybody's working through their own silos and we lack this connectivity and data sharing ability. The vision and what we're building at Blue Shield of California is we like to call it an experience cube. Imagine an experience cube, which is a data platform in which providers, payers, and members all have access to the same data, the same information. There's transparency of that data. We're making decisions from one set of that data as to how do we improve the health, health outcomes for that particular member versus the experience we have today, as you heard Arun talk about uh, with his daughter, uh, that you have to go to many different doctors. No one talks to one another. I have to continually reshare my information and I'm not creating that connected holistic experience. So this is in fact what we're driving in our digital transformation and the, and the creation of what we're referring to the single pane of glass of information that we call the experience cube. But let me share a couple more examples that I think would be really relevant to some of the digital technologies that we're doing to ultimately impact the member and provider experience. You know, first from a personal care standpoint, shared decision-making, and you heard Arun talk about this as well, enables our members to choose personalized evidence-based care plans. So we're building a technical platform. We have, we have been performing small experiments with providers that share and review with the member a course of treatments with industry accepted protocols in a tool. This enables the provider to leverage holistic health information uh, in an in-person or virtual care visit. The result will be the right user experience to have both the member and the provider arrive at the best care plan together. It sounds simple, right? Shared decision-making. You think this would be the norm of how we should be executing today, but unfortunately it's not. You know, at the heart of it, when we think about high tech and high touch is the ability to create this accessible, integrated, this comprehensive digital personal health record. It's got to be the center at which we're all deriving the same information to create access to these longitudinal patient records, records so that regardless of who's providing the member care, there is a full respective medical record available at the point of care. So that's one example as we're building a longitudinal patient record working with a set of partners in order to create this experience for our members and with their providers. And then the last example I'll give of digital technologies is trying to reduce the administrative burden for our providers and simplifying the claims experience for our members through real-time claims settlement. Now, wouldn't it be nice as I go into my doctor's office that I get a bill, I know exactly what I'm paying for, and I pay that bill or make a payment, and there's no surprises. What happens today? We all know that we get something in the mail. We don't quite understand what it means. We're not sure what we're paying for. So speeding up the process of submitting a claim only solves for one segment, though, of the administrative process. So our real-time claim settlement solution solves for the entire revenue cycle for our provider. So meaning after the medical procedure or treatment, Blue Shield can take that information from the provider's electronic health record, translate it into a claim, adjudicate it, and provide payment information to the provider in real time. Not only does that remove the administrative burden of our providers, it gives that provider more time to spend with the patient and it solves that and re creates a better experience for our members as well. So those are just a couple examples of what we're doing with digital technologies 
that not only drive better health outcomes, but also improve that provider and member experience. Thanks, Lisa. And Very I know cool. that you are also, oh, Yarun, would you like? No, I, 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 you know, I come from the financial services industry and uh, uh, I worked 20 years ago on uh, global payment networks and at Citibank where I ran the tech lab, we were the first to launch internet banking. And um, so Lisa kind of triggers my, my thoughts on, you know, this real time, you know, Diego talked about real time, but linking that to real time, you know, claims handling, payments, I think that's a major step up. I, I, I think if we start thinking in these terms about the system, you know, there, there's 20 to 25% waste in the system. And a lot of it is because of administration, unnecessary tests, unnecessary, you know, procedures, mistakes, gaps in the care, not enough preventative. So I, th I think we're talking here about a couple of pillars to address waste in a system that's so important to us that if we could reinvest all that the money to make it more efficient into better care and better access I, I think we have a double whammy and just just to put a dimension on it the waste in the US is bigger than the entire GDP of my country the Netherlands so so we're talking about a big opportunity here absolutely yeah and Diego I saw you nodding your head too any any thoughts on this yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think um, as we look towards the future, and I think Lisa, you put it, uh, you really, um, you really spot on there in terms of, of how do we simplify care for patients? How do we simplify it for the providers um, and really uh, accomplish things in real time? It, it's truly that real time essence that eliminates all the, the waste that Yarun is, is talking about. And, um, you know, if we can create billing uh, environments that are going to occur in real time and really facilitate even the referral process for physicians so that, um, you know, patients are arriving at the right level of care at the right time. And um, what we see very often is, is that there, there's a lot of middlemen in the play, so to speak, where the wrong tests are being ordered, uh, the wrong level of care is being delivered and ultimately by the time that the appropriate level of care with the appropriate uh, specialist is delivering the care the tests are either repeated or done in a different way where so much of what was originally done in the workup um, has been eliminated or, or considered to be inconsequential and um, I think there's a lot of opportunities there and uh, certainly, if, if we're going to look at this, if we, you know, we're having a conversation about the future, if we're going to look at this in a space age kind of approach, I think natural language processing in the future is going to absolutely change everything about both telemedicine, tele-ICU care, billing processes, um, and how we deliver care uh, more efficiently. Uh, so we're a little bit away from that, but I, I think that we're already starting to see the genesis of where that will be going and, and affecting care ultimately in the future. Uh, Diego, I wanna pick up on something you say about referrals because uh, it's rare that one system can fulfill all your, your health needs. And um, I think referrals are still very much on need to know or no. Um, and I think if we can build a more objectivity in the referral system, let's say, hey, your patient with this kind of profile, not just clinical, but also the way you need to be cared for. And here's a, a group of providers and this provider has the best match and availability. And therefore we connect the two of you. And we have that longitudinal record that Lisa talks about tying it together and we string it together in a pathway that's personalized to that patient. I think that would be a real efficiency gain because right now you're refer. If, if I look at my own case, I'm referred by my GP to somebody he, he happens to know who refers me to someone he happens to know. And nobody cares if it takes six weeks for me to get my next appointment, which literally happened. Well, if it was a virtual network, you know, I could have done my ultrasound and one hour later, I could have sat virtually with an internist discussing my ultrasound and deciding on what my medication would be. But it's just not the way things work today. And what I'm proposing is not crazy because it's happening in other industries at scale. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And sort of you're in, you're in building on that concept of building that referral network with others. Um, we know that no one player in this space can take all of this on on their own and make it successful. So I do want to spend a little bit time of time talking about partnership and collaboration amongst all of you before we open it up to questions. And we're getting a lot of great questions in the chat box. So if others have them, please continue to um, put them in and we'll get to them shortly. Um, but let's start with sort of the partnership between Phillips and your organization, Dr. Um, Diego. Um, can you share a little bit about that partnership and what you're working on together and what outcomes you hope to achieve? Yeah, I mean, our, our relationship with Phillips is, um, is a few years old now, and um, we've really been blessed to have the opportunity to work together with such an incredible organization that has such a wide, uh, you know, reach uh, internationally. But really what, what we've been able to do, I think we, this is truly a, a symbiotic relationship where we really uh, support uh, uh, Philips in, in, um, in, in terms of, of delivering care. So, you know, the technology platform is, is a very important platform that is used to deliver care, but it's at the end of the day, it is a tool for care delivery. And at the end of the day, what our companies coming together, what it does is it creates access for, you know, this kind of technology may not be accessible to all the hospitals in America. Right now, it's, it's, it's very accessible and is widely used in, um, in a lot of the major centers in America that are using EICU to deliver care. Um, but what we do is, is help to leverage our resources to be able to deliver that care to even the two or 300 bed hospital in, in, in the middle of, uh, you know, middle America somewhere that perhaps may have no, no intensivists, no ICU nurses to deliver care to those patients. So, you know, that's really where we've been um, able to, um, to be effective um, in delivering care and, and really improving the outcomes. Because at the end of the day, we have a lot of conversations about money. We have a lot of conversations about efficiency, but First and foremost, what stands before all of us is that we got to take good care of the patients. And, um, and you know, uh, at our company, you know, we're, we're constantly looking to expand our services, expand, um, you know, our product lines as, as to what we're delivering in the tele-ICU, as well as the tele-stroke uh, avenue, as well as now looking to expand into skilled nursing facilities and in other environments where uh, telemedicine is really going to going to be uh, of tremendous importance as our population gets older um, and, and, you know, we're utilizing these services far more often in an environment where there's already a shortfall of intensivists, primary care physicians, geriatricians, et cetera. Um, we're really looking to take a very limited resource and apply it in a very wide way, all while using technology to help, to help you know, broaden our platform. But at the end of the day, we can work towards doing all these things, but we got to take good care of the patients. And, and that's really what we pride ourselves on in our company is to really be a high touch company where we provide a white glove service. We're, we're utilizing the tool, which is the, you know, without a doubt, the, um, you know, the sine qua non of, of the this technology in the world today with eCare Manager. And so this is what we're looking to do to deliver a, a good level of care. And that partnership um, that we've built over the years in terms of, again, creating referral sources for each other, um, really finding ways where our company would really fit in very well with hospitals throughout the United States um, in order to, to achieve those goals and giving access to everyone, right? It shouldn't just be in New York, California, Los Angeles, and Miami, it should be that everyone gets th that same level of care all over the world, and, and particularly as we speak in the United States, um, where we know that care is not the same. Uh, care is 100% not the same. And in some parts, there's less access to it. And in those same parts, that care is a lot more expensive because it's being delivered by, by um, folks that are just not trained in doing this level of care. And so um, that's where our partnership has, has really uh, yielded the ability to deliver um, a high quality, low cost care in those environments. 
Thanks, Diego. And Yarun, can you touch a little bit more just in, you know, either with the partnership that you have with Diego's um, organization or just in general, key aspects of partnerships that allow you to improve technology while helping patients? Yeah, I, I think something has fundamentally changed in the way we, we engage as a company. So, you know, we were really good at modalities. So great patient monitors, Diego can vouch for that. Uh, great uh, MRI machines and uh, sleep, sleep and respiratory ventilators. Uh, but, but we felt the future is really uh, enabling what, what Diego is talking about. Personalized care, high quality care, independent of where you are. And we believe that we cannot do that alone. We have to deeply collaborate with, with, with companies like uh, Telemed so that we really deeply understand what technology we can bring to bear to expand the scope and the scale of, of his operation. Because, you know, we generally believe it's the right thing for the world. And it's, uh, uh, but it's also a model that we can expand to many other spaces, to the cardiovascular space, to the, um, you know, oncology space to, you know, uh, home monitoring. And, uh, and, and there's not a single, you know, vendor that can do that all. So we increasingly look at how can we plug into, you know, let's say Lisa systems and, and make that seamless for both parties because um, how do we connect to the epics and the Cerners out there? And maybe they can be a little bit more proactive in <laughs> opening up their data pipes. Um, uh, but the same for us. I, 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 I said, you know, if anybody ever tells us that we're not sharing data, then come to me and I will personally fix it because I genuinely believe that what it's, that's what it takes to, to get us there and not by sitting on our data, by sharing data and providing the technology to interpret it and take action on it. So um, I see the world as, uh, as a big ecosystem play where we're gonna increasingly add value in the terms that Diego's talking about. You know, uh, best care at the right time, safe, secure, and on your terms. And, Wonderful. And, you know, Lisa, payers are also part of this collaboration and partnership. So who are you partnering with? Who do you think you should be partnering with? Well, it, it's, it's, you know, as Arun and Diego were talking about, you know, I, I, I always think of the expression, it takes a village. Um, and in order to create this digital health ecosystem that we all have been talking about, that's personalized, holistic, high tech, high touch with uh, our members that are front and center in the experience that they're receiving. It requires an ecosystem of partners. It's never going to be a one size fits all. And our consumers, our members expect to have that same ease of experience with healthcare as they do with technology from companies in other sectors. You know, Room brought up financial services, um, how we have retail today, what is that experience? The time is now um, in which in healthcare, we need to create that same experience. So we've also pivoted in our strategy uh, of recognizing the need to one, have an ecosystem of partners, but partners that are aligned to our vision, our core values of what we wanna create, uh, that are willing to put some skin in the game that realize the data sharing and data interoperability have to be front and center. So we have been partnering over the last year with many leading tech companies as we transition from really an on-prem infrastructure to the cloud, uh, including with their data. They have a deep understanding of what consumers need and what they want from a digital experience that's going to help us enable our healthcare reimagined strategy, which is a strategy that frankly, we wanna to bring to market in the next three years. So we have a very detailed, implementation plan, starting with real-time claims and key initiatives under this healthcare reimagined umbrella that will bring to market with providers in 21, even more so in 22, and then full scale and into market by 2023. 
of how we redefined that experience uh, for the members. So we have a slew of partners with very key guiding principles of how we engage that make sure that we're all moving in the same direction that ultimately can create this vision we have. Great, thank you. And so a lot of questions are coming in related to this topic of collaboration and partnership. So I'm gonna turn to um, those questions now. Um, the first one is in, in context of partnerships and collaborations, um, do your organizations have formal best practices around strategic alliances, um, including developing internal staff in these skills? Um, so maybe Lisa, I can talk with you and then go to Yarun. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I mean. For us, it started with a set of guiding principles. I think this is, a, this is a great place to just kind of begin your thinking of what is important to your company and to your mission? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, what are those core values of who we want to partner with? And that is the basis of the strategic partnerships that we have been creating. Ensuring that those partners are aligned to our vision, our goals, and our values as a company and what we want to create in transforming the healthcare experience. Um, second of all, it's, it's also as you engage with those partners, and yes, this requires skills on both the IT side and the business side, because it's just not led by IT. These are partnerships. Part of what we've done at Blue Shield is foundationally change the model of how the IT organization engages with the business. We've moved from being a service provider organization to moving to a portfolio and product model, very closely collaborating with our business partners. So it's the business strategy, it's the company strategy and mission. The IT organization, my organization is enabler of that, creating the tools, providing the tools and the platforms that create that experience. And then working with these partners that are going to invest in the end state and the outcomes that we're driving to um, so that we can create something um, that's going to be a better experience for ultimately our members and providers. So I, I would start there with the basics. Yeah, I think that's a good place. Yarun, anything from the Phillips perspective? Yeah, we, um, so, uh... We, we, we have basically three types of partnerships and, and we have a, a strategic alliances team that specifically looks at large scale partnerships with people like Amazon or uh, Microsoft or, you know, CVS or Walgreens. Um, and then we have our, our clinical partnerships and, and we have 3,500 research alliances. So where we jointly do research and they're typically university medical centers. But I think the most exciting ones for me are the, the co-innovation partnerships where we really work together to jointly work on, on challenges. And that's the kind of relationship we have with Diego where um, you know, we get deeply into the way he runs his, his organization and see how we can enable that. And then really think through how we can scale it and, and, and bring it to others as well. And uh, we have a couple of really big ones. So out of the top 10 hospitals in the world by US News, um, 10 of them we have a, an innovation relationship with. So 10 out of 10 is not a bad, bad score. And then we have invested in 220 uh, ventures outside Philips that we take a stake in either directly get involved in or indirectly. And uh, so with that, we also expand our kind of external footprint. So you can see that you can already sense that this is becoming part of our, our DNA. Now, it wasn't the case a couple of years back. So it, it, it kind of takes a, a pretty strong effort. And the one I'm most proud of is the relationship we started with uh, the life sciences with pharma where we now have relationship with most of the big pharma companies on uh, biomarker development, but, but also you know, supporting clinical trials or real world evidence of, uh, of therapies and uh, where we just support it with diagnostic or monitoring uh, propositions. So um, yeah, the, we kind of turned the company inside out, if you will. <laughs> Yeah. Diego, any thoughts on how you decide who you're going to collaborate with? 
Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Priya. And I think I go back to Lisa's comments uh, where, uh, you know, she mentioned that you got to go back to the basics. And, and uh, that's really the way that we evaluate our partnerships. And I think that, um, you know, the, the whole must be greater than its individual parts. So um, I, I really think that when two companies are collaborating, that they're both collaborating to bring something that's greater than just one plus one equals two. Um, and, and it's incredibly important that each, um, each company brings something that helps catalyze the reaction that is, that is greater than the sum of its parts. And um, that, that's really what the way that we evaluate our relationships. And, and you know, we've, uh, you know, we are in, obviously in the process of, um, you know, growing a company and we have strategic alliances as well. And in that process, that's really what I, I don't, I wouldn't say that we have any best practices per se, but what I would say is, is that we always go back to the root core of what our principles are and is number one, we want to take excellent care of the patients above and beyond everything else. If you do that, you know, companies make money, everyone, you know, does well and, and, and good things happen. That's really what we, that is what's most important, I think, is to take good care of the patients. So when we're analyzing our um, strategic alliances, that's the first thing that we look at is to say, are they, um, you know, uh, strategically and spiritually in the same place as we are when we're looking to roll out services? Mm -hmm. And then are we truly complementary to each other? Will we Will we actually bring um, individual pieces that will that will take both of our companies uh, into better directions um, and into other avenues that perhaps neither neither company had access to before? That that's real. Those are really kind of the the cornerstones behind the way we evaluate uh, those relationships. I, I couldn't emphasize that anymore. Great and. One of the questions that's come in is related to a topic that we haven't had much time to talk about in depth, um, and that is data. Um, so in terms of getting access to data, um, this question is specifically to you, you, Yarun, but I do want to hear from everyone. Um, what kind of data would you be willing to share with startups to support technology development? Yeah, I, I, let me take a good example. Um, so Diego uh, is talking about our EICU, and, and actually we, we set up a pretty interesting model with the EICU. We basically said to, to you know, our, our customers, if you share anonymized data with, you, with us, we're going to give you back benchmark information. So, um, and then we worked together with Mass General um, and creating a curated data set of ICU patients with longitudinal uh, EMR data, uh, which we make available to, uh, to research. It's, it's the MIMIC database and, and Diego knows that. Um, but we, we've been quite proactive also in creating these almost open source data sets that allow innovators and, and researchers uh, to start working on this. We're, we're also actually in uh, radiology, uh, we're very active in creating an AI community um, where we have multiple startups participating um, on our, our, our platform where we also have um, annotated data and images that can be used to develop uh, to do discovery, develop algorithms or validate algorithms. And we see that increasingly as becoming a space that, that is very important for innovation. Um, in many cases, it will require consent from uh, patients to uh, make that data available anonymized. But interestingly, we found that if we can guarantee that this information is used to create better outcomes, better care, that actually most patients are willing to participate. And as long as you can guarantee, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the anonymization of it. So I, I think that's a big opportunity, especially if you also, you know, going back to real-time care, if you want to do real-time care, you need real-time data but you need to contextualize the real-time data. So I, I can look at seven vital signs on the monitor, but, and I can have a bleep uh, when it goes out of range, but it's more important that I can contextualize that if I know what the longitudinal view is of that patient, what disease state that the patient is in, I can interpret it, the state of that patient. I can look at trends that 
you know, indicate stabilization or, you know, deterioration. And, and again, Diego knows that because his model is based on, on having these algorithms guide his intensivist to the right patient at the right time. And I think we can super scale these kind of things. But, but the only reason we could build these algorithms together with Diego and Mass General and all these others, because the participants were willing to share data. Diego or Lisa, do you have other thoughts on this data question? Yeah, I think uh, you cannot emphasize anymore the importance of the data, right? And, and the safe usage of the data and the appropriate usage of the data. As Jeroen said, I think uh, what, what in our relationship with, with Philips, what we've had is we've had access to all this data um, that is really, it's important because it allows it allows our EICU program to, to compare ourselves to the benchmarks of, of all other EICUs that are that are within the United States, as well as the, the, a couple that are abroad. And so it, what it allows you to instantly do is, is that in a very um, particular niche environment, you're able to really compare what it, what it is that the, the level of care that you're delivering um, and comparing that to, to the rest of, of the United States. Um, there's very few examples uh, in data today that you can say that you can actually get that done. And so um, you can utilize that data in an anonymized way to help develop new algorithms um, that, again, ultimately, at the end of the day, will be utilized to, to deliver care. I mean, Philips has... I can't even, I mean, I'm not even sure what the number is now, Yeroen, you can probably say it better than me, but I would say on the scale of hundreds of millions of data points that, that have been collected over the last 15 years that have individually created new treatment algorithms and predictive analytics formulas, which are oftentimes essential in being able to deliver care in a proactive way inside of an ICU. The goal again is to be able to detect the problem before it happens as opposed to react to it eight hours later. That eight hours later is going to lead to a complication which ultimately leads to more expensive care. So um, when, when you're looking at the data, um, there's no doubt that the data is the most important, one of the most important facets of, of what we, you know, end product of what we look at today um, and using it in, in, a, in, a, in a proactive way, couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't emphasize that anymore. Now, Will you be able to use this data in, in you know, to, to create your own, uh, you know, technology set? Unlikely, but, but certainly to help uh, deliver new treatment algorithms, new workflows within an ICU as well as other environments. There's no doubt about it that that's something that, um, at least in our relationship at Intercept with Philips, um, we've, we've clearly benefited from that and um, uh, actually look forward to benefiting from that more in the future. That's awesome. Um, Lisa, I'll sort of give you the last word on this data question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think my colleagues covered it pretty well. I think the question was around um, sharing data, certainly with startups. And, and, and last I checked, I didn't think Philips was a startup. Um, so um, under 30 years, under yeah, 30 years yeah, old, Lisa. E exactly. So, you know, just to, just to kind of summarize, the security of the data and the privacy of members are always front and center. Uh, there are ways to anonymize the data. There are ways to remove PHI, et cetera. Have we done that with startups? Absolutely. Um, it goes back to what are those partnerships based on? Uh, what are we trying to accomplish together? Uh, are we driving to better health outcomes and improving that member experience? Uh, so we have done that and uh, we are open, uh, certainly from a driving innovation standpoint to continue doing that uh, with startups. Wonderful. And I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. Um, so I will just ask this one, which is um, give us some examples of how you see healthcare looking more like re retail like consumer services. So how, how are we moving to that consumerism in a retail like way? Um, Lisa, let's can start with you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think we've talked about several examples um, of creating that retail like experience and you know I'll share again our real time claims uh, settlement 
right? Creating that experience. When I go into the doctors, I pay my bill. I know exactly what I'm paying for, just like I'm going into the grocery store. I think other examples of things we talked about today is how do we make healthcare more personalized? I gave an example of shared decision-making between provider members and payers. Um, data is at the heart of how we create this digital health ecosystem that's again, personalized, um, holistic in terms of an individual's health and high tech and high touch. So if we think around those pillars and we think about driving what is better outcomes and experience for providers and members, incorporating lessons, frankly, from other sectors, whether it's financial that Arun mentioned earlier, how do we bring those digital experiences and interweave them, integrate them around data interoperability, a longitudinal patient record? I think we start to go a long way moving in the right direction of what we want a digital health ecosystem to be. Thanks. And so we have about 30 or 40 seconds left. Um, Yarun or Diego, any retail option that you want to raise today? Yeah, I, I, I think um, I, I was talking to one of her customers and I said, your clinics look like a hospital. Turn them into a health hub, you know, make it a, a you know, a, a consumer appealing environment where you can get educated while you wait, while, you know, where, where it's all about health. And then give that 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 always on digital experience. You know, mom, again, my daughter has a continuous glucose meter. She has a smart insulin pen. She wears a Fitbit. You know, bring it together. Give her the opportunity to just press a button and say, "Hey, you know, I'm low. I don't know what to do. Nurse, please help me now and uh, get me to a better place." That's you know, instant gratification, real time, personalized and combined with a, a physical presence that's you know compelling and, and modern and health oriented and not disease oriented well thank you Yarun and diego and lisa for being with us today and providing your insights on digital transformation and the future of our healthcare ecosystem um, thank you also to our audience for listening in and now i will hand it back over to the health team Thank you to Priya and to all of our panelists. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now relax and unwind with a guided meditation session with Casey Lane. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Lane. Thank you so much for those of you who can stay. I'm going to take us through a fairly brief guided meditation and some grounding exercises, which I find can be extremely helpful, especially as we are all spending an abundant amount of time in this digital platform where so much energy is being taken in and we're looking at our screens. So this is really an opportunity to ground down, take our focus inward and do something just kind for yourself. So if you'd like to join me, I'm of the mindset you're welcome to stay in your chair, but you're also more than welcome if it would feel better to sit on the floor against a wall, or if it is accessible in the space that you're in to even lie down on the floor, find yourself in a comfortable position. Traditionally, uh, meditations often happen in a seat, but I encourage you to take whatever position is going to feel the most beneficial for you today. So take a moment and roll your shoulders up toward your ears. Take a big breath in through your nose and big open mouth exhale as your shoulders draw back down. Good. And from here, if you are seated in a chair, I encourage you to scoot slightly forward so that you're right on top of your sits bones and you can feel your feet touching the ground. If you'd like, you can place your palms face down on your thighs for a sensation of grounding. And if you're craving maybe more energizing qualities, maybe palms face up. But find a place where your hands can rest. And see if you can soften the backs of your eyelids so that all of the external stimulation that you were just taking in 
starts to just melt away and can be set to the side, even just for a moment. If closing your eyes is not really resonating with you today, feel free to gaze at the tip of your nose or at something not moving about six inches out in front of you. And from here, I will guide us through a body scan and so much of the work in meditation, it's not necessarily about achieving this goal of perfect bliss, but rather bringing awareness to areas of our body where maybe there is a bit of tension or tightness and seeing if we can naturally ease some relaxation by focusing our breath toward areas that are craving a bit of release. So no worries if at any point your mind feels distracted. I invite you to just keep coming back to the sensation of your breath. And we'll start by taking three almost exaggerated big breaths together. So exhale completely. <sighs> From here, deep breath in through your nose. Feel your belly and chest expand. Hold your breath at the top. Maybe sip in another inch of air. Big open mouth exhale. Sigh it out. <sighs> Two more just like that. Smooth breath in. Fill up, take your time, no rush. Pause for a moment at the top. Option to sip in another inch of air and then big sigh out. Can you notice your shoulders dropping away from your ears here? One more energizing breath. Breathe in, feel your side body expanding. Can you imagine the crown of your head is lifting even higher up toward the ceiling? And then big sigh out, feel where your seat is connected to your chair or the ground. And now from here, simply allow your breath to exist and rhythmically flow in whatever pace or rhythm feels the most natural. So no need to force the breath. If it feels good to have long breaths, you're more than welcome to do so but almost like an oceanic wave that ebbs and flows to shore and then back into the ocean. Just allow your breath to do the same. But even though we are not forcing our breath, can all of your focus be toward the inhale and the exhale? And if it's helpful, you might think to yourself as you inhale, I am. Exhale, right here. Inhaling, I am. Exhale, right here. Keeping that message with you so that when the mind inevitably wanders at some point toward the future, the past, a to-do list, that is extremely natural. But instead of running away with your thoughts, you can simply think to yourself, inhale, I am. Exhale right here and know that by focusing all of your attention toward the breath, toward this mantra, I am right here, you're actually changing your brain in real time. So many studies done on how focusing in meditation can actually increase our capacity for memory the gray matter in our brain can expand and change. So trust that even if it feels like nothing is happening at all, there's value in drawing your focus back to the breath. Inhale, I am. Exhale right here. And you have that mantra that you can keep with you if you notice your mind wandering. And for now, I invite you to visualize a glowing, beaming light. And this light might have a color attached to it if you would like. No need to question or second guess any color that comes to mind. Visualize this beaming color will help to nurture any areas of tension in your body along with the breath. 
So starting at the crown of your head, visualize this glowing beaming color pouring across your forehead, really softening the space between your eyes, all of those muscles around your forehead, down your cheeks, maybe even bringing a bit of space between your upper and lower teeth so that your jaw softens a bit. Tongue rests at the bottom of your mouth. That glowing, comforting light of energy starts to pour down your neck all the way toward your shoulders. Maybe you even sense a bit of warmth, a comforting sensation across your heart space as this color melts any tension through your chest, down your arms, all the way toward your hands. Visualize this color now trickling down your spine. Maybe you sit up a bit taller and at the same time, as you sit taller, you feel this color expanding down toward your hips, really rooting you down. So notice where is your body connected to your chair or the ground? And can you really let your chair or the ground almost lift up to meet your body? So there's nothing to hold on to here. You are fully supported. Continue to visualize that color moving down your legs, just scanning for any areas that are craving more release, more comfort, more relaxation. And maybe if you find any areas you imagine sending your breath and that glowing light color toward that specific area of your body. Continue to feel your breath as you visualize this color moving all the way down toward your feet. Good, feel where your feet are in contact with the ground underneath you. Notice where your feet are touching the earth. And almost imagining your entire body is wrapped up in a blanket of this light energy, this color that's comforting from the top of your head all the way down to your feet. Take a long, expansive breath in, I am. Exhale right here on your own, on your own a few breaths. Good. Inhaling, I am. Exhale right here. And whatever is more helpful in this moment, whether it is the visualization of that glowing color, or maybe the mantra, I am right here. Take the next minute, I have my eye on the clock, to really dedicate in silence, my voice will drop out, all of your focus toward that the breath, the color, the groundedness of your body, or maybe inhale, I am, exhale right here, remembering that in real time you are making an impact and this is such a valuable way to take care of yourself. If your mind wanders, that is extremely natural. In fact, it's expected, but invite yourself to come back to your breath, to the color, I am right here, just about a minute in silence on your own.
Allow your next breath in to be a bit longer, a bit deeper. Again, you might hold your breath at the top. Open mouth, exhale, sigh it out. Take a moment, if it resonates, you might draw one hand onto your heart, one hand onto your belly, just making this point of connection and really thanking yourself for taking the time 15 minutes might seem very long, it might seem short, but the intentional act of really showing up for your own self is extremely powerful. So just thanking yourself for being here. And before you fully open your eyes, you might start to rock your head a little side to side, just inviting some intuitive movement, maybe now rolling out your wrists, wiggling your fingers. And as you're ready, allow your eyes to gently blink open, but I encourage you to kind of take inventory of your space before you look at the screen. Just notice where you are. Notice the colors that are in the room reorienting your body in the space. And then as you feel ready, you can draw your attention back to the screen, knowing that while we are all in different spaces, um, there is this connected quality. You are not doing this alone. There are others who are joining you on this journey of going inward and practicing. And I really want to emphasize it really is a practice of stilling the mind. Um, I think a big misunderstanding of yoga is this idea with yoga and meditation that you're supposed to not think about anything. And really our brain is designed to think for us. So it's so natural for our thoughts to rapid fire. And so even if they were rapid firing during this meditation, trust that there's value in what you just did. And at any point throughout the rest of your day, if it's helpful, you find yourself maybe scattered or thinking about lots of things at once, you can just draw hands onto your body, whether it's one hand to belly, one hand to heart, or hands onto your thighs and think, I am right here and invite yourself back to this present moment. Again, my name is Casey Lane. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. Um, if you have any questions um, about what we did today, feel free to reach out to me at caseylaneyoga at gmail.com. Or if you have any feedback or anything that you would like to see more of, feel free to reach out to the health team. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Again, my name is Casey Lane and have a beautiful rest of your day.